coffee, I usually make it at work, and then I yell out my name incorrectly, and then I set a five-pound bill on fire, and I think it's roughly, it's roughly the same experience. So let's dive back into the 90s. Uh, in the 90s, browser development tooling looked very, very different to how it does today. Uh, we sort of had a ton of bookmarklets and extensions, and we duct taped together some sort of tooling experience that helped us build what were relatively static sites that weren't particularly complex. Now, over time, um, things have changed. Uh, in 2015, we're increasingly building um, more and more ambitious applications. We're building things that require thought about the devices that we're supporting, motion, performance, accessibility, security. Um, and as we've been building things that um, require us to think more um, about the types of applications that we're building, we've also had um, to require our browser development tools to evolve along with us. Now, they've done a decent job of this. Um, in fact, cross-browser development tooling is actually at a pretty good place at the moment, and not just in Chrome, in, in Firefox, and, and even Edge, and other places as well. Um, the browser developer tools have sort of evolved into a little bit of a megazord of sorts when it comes to tooling. Um, I really love Power Rangers. They taught me a lot when I was growing up. Perhaps the, the best lesson the Power Rangers taught me was that if you have an adversary or someone that you really don't get along with, if you just like stand in front of them and you look at them really, really aggressively, eventually they will blow up. <laughs> now, one of the first things that I wanted to talk about was UX, or, or rather DX, developer experience. Um, one of the things that we noticed uh, a while back was that uh, a lot of people use the elements panel. So in DevTools, about 90% of people use the elements panel. It's the most popular. Um, but for the longest time, um, we didn't take a look at uh, what, what the next popular panel was. And in fact, it's console. Um, a lot of the time, you'll either you know, hit escape and try opening up the console from the bottom of the screen, or you'll have to go to the very end of the DevTools. And we thought that rather than having to make you go through that pain, what if we just moved the console tab to second? So a few weeks ago, we did that. Console is now the second tab. It's way easier to get to it. Now, as soon as you start moving things around in a UI that people use every day, some people will start to get grumpy. Um, and they'll, they'll ask you other things, like, what if, what if I wanted to you know, change the position of other tabs other than the console tab. So we started looking at this. Um, and again, a few weeks ago, we actually added in support for um, moving tabs. So let's say that you wanted to rearrange tabs. So you're working on like a performance problem. Um, rather than just having to have a static positioning to these things, you can move like the timeline, the audits. You can move um, anything to do with performance straight to the very front. So you're focused on just a set of tabs that you care about for the specific problem that you're working on right now. Um, I've been using this quite a lot, and it's really, really helped my workflow. Earlier on in the year, we discovered a lot of people were starting to write their, I, I'm going to continue calling it ES6 until the day I die, ES 2015 code. They've been writing their ES 2015 code um, a lot in the console, just playing around with it, and just using it for general debugging a lot more. Uh, so we added support for syntax highlighting to the console, so you get the same you know, richness of syntax highlighting that you get everywhere else. Um, we've also added support for Emoji, that was like a P0, very, very important, in case you're wondering what the DevTools team are spending their time on. Emoji is also supported there, so you have no excuse to not be using Emoji in your console log statement. Works great. Uh, we've been doing a lot of experiments lately. One thing that we thought would be kind of interesting was uh, what if you, know, you could go to um, About Inspect or Chrome Inspect um, and visualize like your node apps there so that you could treat them the same way that you could device targets. Uh, this, is, this work is still very, very early on, but um, imagine if rather than having to use Node Inspector, you could just like, open up the DevTools and start um, debugging your node apps directly from there. So that's one of the early projects we're working on at the moment. Um, we think it's going to be interesting. Uh, we've also done a ton of work uh, recently trying to improve um, your ability to avoid having to go back to physical devices to, to test mobile. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the newer stuff we've been doing there, but this is basically the DevTools device mode. I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail um, soon. But two quick things. So in the last two weeks, uh, we added two features that we think are kind of neat. Um, and, and we've been working on this for a while. Uh, the first is a new security panel. Uh, so security is important. It tends to be one of the uh, three unholy pillars of web development. Like it's hard to get people to care about performance and accessibility, and security is just one more of those things. 
So uh, we added a new security panel. Now this makes it easy for you to go and check on you know, whether a site is secure. You can check out whether they've got secure origins, list out all the different um, domains that it's relying on. It'll show you whether it's got a valid certificate or not. Um, on a site that doesn't have particularly good security, it will let you know that it's not secure. Um, it'll also show you if you've got sort of mixed content errors. Um, and if uh, there are resources we can actually point you to, so here for example, you'll see that there's um, a, one particular site we're referencing here that's got mixed content. You can dive right back into the network panel and get a little bit more context around what's going on there. So that's the first thing we add in the last two weeks. The other thing is a new Service Worker panel. Um, now, for anyone that doesn't know what Service Worker is or haven't really played around with it, Service Worker is sort of a background thread of sorts that lets you control your network stack. So you can say, OK, well, I want this particular app or this particular set of resources to work offline. Um, it's sort of what AppCache should have been but wasn't. Um, now, Service Worker, we've been working on Service Worker for quite some time. Um, and debugging Service Worker has been a little bit of a pain. So uh, this is an app written by Paul Kinlan. Uh, it's called Airhorner. Um, if you haven't seen Airhorner before, the, the basic premise here is that it gives you a horn. Um, you go and you tap the horn, and it does that. Best app ever. Um, but that's Airhorner. This is an app that um, has actually got service worker support, so you can, you can load it up offline and it'll just work. But if you go into the resources panel, and you go into service workers, you can actually visualize the entire life cycle of events around your service worker. Um, this is way easier than it's been to debug in the past. You can actually go and debug your service worker scripts. Um, you can, you know, if you're building an app that's using push notifications, I, I think there's a talk about it later on, um, you can easily simulate those push notifications directly from this panel as well, which makes it easier to test. But service worker is one of those things that's probably more for the, the hardcore devs in this, uh, in this room. One thing that is important to everybody here, or should be rather, is performance. So slowness is something that we all care about, um, or rather avoiding slowness. We all want to make sure that the apps that we're building are relatively fast, because a slow experience where your users are still waiting for content to either load on the screen, or they're still waiting to like scroll down something because it's incredibly janky. Those are the types of experiences that can cost you when it comes to revenue, cost you when it comes to people actually coming back and trying out your app. And they're things that you want to avoid. Now, over the last year um, on the Chrome team, we thought it would be interesting to try framing the performance conversation in a way that made sense for the world that we're in today. So a lot of us are building for mobile. We're having to think about touch. We're having to think about limited device capabilities. Um, it's a slightly different world to, to how we used to build desktop apps. And so we came up with this term called rail. Um, or backwards, it's liar. Let's not, let's not focus on that. It's rail. Um, so what rail stands for is the first, well, the R stands for response. Um, that's the finger down experience. If someone is interacting with your app, if they've got their finger down on the screen and they're trying to move something around or they're trying to open up a menu or they're trying to do something with your page, that interaction should take less than 100 milliseconds for something to happen in. That is your budget for that interaction. We find that that works pretty well. The next is animation. Now every single animation frame should complete in about 16.67 milliseconds. Um, if you factor in other things going on with the user's hardware, so they probably have other apps running in the background, they probably have some system processes, you've got less than 16.67 milliseconds. You've got probably more like 10. Now if you chunk the animations that are happening in your app correctly, um, you can achieve this. You can achieve this without experiencing jank. But it's good to have this goal in mind, in particular when you've got some level of you know, delightful animation happening. I stands for idle. Now, idle time is the stuff, it's the, sort of the finger up experience. So let's say I've interacted with your app or your site in some way. Um, I'm now reading the content, or I'm taking a look at the game, or whatever it is that your app does. Um, I'm not actually doing anything with my finger on your screen, not doing anything with your app. That's the point in your app where you want to schedule work that you want to happen but isn't particularly important. You don't want that work to necessarily you know, block the main thread. You don't want it to, to um, impact the user experience in a negative way. Now, traditionally, we haven't actually had a really good way for you to do this. Um, so recently, uh, we gave birth to request idle callback. Now, uh, for anyone that's familiar with request animation frame, request idle callback is a little bit it's a little bit similar. But basically, it gives you a way to tell the browser, here's some work. Maybe it's, you know, logging some analytics work. Here's some work. Go and do it 
when you find that there's not a lot going on. You've got some idle time. Um, and request idle callback is available in Chrome Canary today. You can go and try it out. There's a shim we're also working on that you can test out. And finally, we've got load. Now, everybody knows about the importance of, of sort of load performance, but your goal there, um, particularly on mobile, is trying to ship the goods down in under a thousand milliseconds. Now, that's an incredibly tight budget. You know, a thousand milliseconds isn't a lot of time. Um, but we think that it's achievable, and the types of apps that we're trying to build today uh, use a thousand milliseconds as our baseline. And we're not always hitting it, but we think that it's a, it's a good general target. So, speaking of load, let's talk about network. Um, the network panel and the stuff that we've been doing there to try making achieving things like rail a little bit easier. Now the first thing that we worked on was Filmstrip. So let's say this is sfgate.com. It's a particularly not fast site. Um, and so we're in the network panel at the moment. And a new option we've added is this little video camera um, that has capture screenshots on it. So we're just going to hit record. We're going to uh, record this page. Um, we watch the, the network waterfall occurring and this is slowly loading in the content. So we've already hit 198 network requests. This is great. 280, 305, 340. It's just not never ending. Um, but what you now get is actually uh, this whole pane, this brand new pane of screenshots that show you the network transition of, of what's been happening. You can see exactly at what point those pixels were painted to the screen. So we start off with this blank canvas, and then we start drawing all of these different components to the page. So you can see exactly when you know, your first meaningful paint occurred. In this app, it was around six seconds before the user actually saw any real text or content that, that was useful to them. Um, you keep going through, and you'll find that you know, there's a point when web fonts start to kick in, and then ads start to kick in, and then everything in the page starts moving around. But we think that network um, film strip is something that's going to be useful to you, and, and hopefully you'll check it out. Another thing that's useful is throttling. So um, there's this, I, I can't remember who came up with this quote, but it's, uh, before you marry a person, you should first make them use a computer with slow internet to see who they really are. <laughs> it's probably very true, and it's good advice. But when you're working on an app or a site that has to work really well on mobile, you know yourselves. You're like, you know, ha most of you probably came in a, on a train today or on a bus, and you probably didn't have a perfect network connection the entire time that you were there. If you're on hotel Wi-Fi or conference Wi-Fi, I haven't tried the conference Wi-Fi here. It could be amazing. Um, I've been to many conferences where the Wi-Fi really sucks, and you can't trust it all the time to be perfect. So you, you want to be testing out the network um, conditions that your users are, are going to be experiencing out in the wild. So uh, something that we added was support for throttling. So if you go to the network panel, you'll see that we have this drop down here that says no throttling at the moment. Um, and if you check out this little um, expanded box, you'll see that we've got a few options. Um, let's try out good 2G, which will throttle it down to about 450 kilobytes. And when we try loading up sfgate.com now, um, so here we've hit the white screen. We're still waiting for content. All of those network requests are still happening. But we don't actually have any meaningful content here. It's like 11, 12 seconds in. We're still seeing a blank page. Um, still going, still going, still going. This is starting to feel like an NPM install. Um, it's just like, <laughs> so 26 seconds in, I finally have some text. Um, and maybe at some point, I'll be able to see. There's some web fonts. And I'll, maybe I'll be able to see a picture of what's going on with us at some point. Um, but network throttling is just really good for, for getting it to experience the real pain that your users feel out in the wild. Now, we think that the presets that we've given you are probably useful, but you might be targeting people that you know, are maybe in emerging markets. Maybe they're um, going to be working with a specific type of network connection. Maybe you know, the app that you're building is just for people that are you know, working out of coffee shops or something. Um, so another thing that we've added is the ability to customize that throttling experience a little bit more. So this is Pinterest.com. And um, I looked up Space Cats because science and reasons. Um, but uh, this is basically a page that contains a whole lot of images. There's a lot going on here. Um, and I'm just going to open up the dev tools on this page. And uh, we're going to refresh. So let's refresh this page and take a look at what the experience is like normally. It's got 196 network requests and 3.8 megs of data. It's not, it's not completely terrible. Um, but we're just going to toggle the DevTools device mode. We're going to go to Nexus 6, because we want to emulate Nexus 6. Um, and 
rather than going and setting it to one of these presets, we're just going to hit Add instead. This is going to take you to the DevTools settings pane. I'm going to emulate a Starbucks network and say that the throughput is 100 kilobytes. Let's say it's a Starbucks with lots of developers, so 100 kilobytes seems decent. We're going to add that profile, um, close up settings, and uh, let's say that we're just going to go back to device mode. So there's two places that you can set your throttling settings, either inside the network panel or inside a device mode. So we're just going to go, and, and you can see that Starbucks is now there. We've set Starbucks to be the, the throttling profile. Um, in this case, I'm just going to load this up directly from about blank so you can see exactly the, uh, the speed differences in loading this up. But it's now taking effect. We're starting to load in content. The waterfall is very, very slowly trying to bring things into the page. We're still sort of very early on in, in terms of being able to draw content here. Um, but just being able to, to have full control over the network throttling stack is kind of useful. There you can see that you know in 20 seconds we finally got um, some, some sort of shell of this page with text content loaded up. So that's, that's sort of custom network throttling profiles. Um, another thing that uh, we're working on at the moment, it still requires a little bit of polish, um, but it should be out soon hopefully, is the ability to block network requests. Now, um, this is, this is what we call a hidden experiment. Um, do you know the way that when you're defining a new password today, it's got to have like, you know, alphanumeric characters, it's got to have numbers, it's got to have, you know, prose and character development and then a mystery ending and all that stuff. We thought it'd be interesting to make the process of enabling hidden experiments just as easy. So there are like four steps involved in enabling hidden experiments. You've got to like go into about flags and relaunch Chrome and then hit shift six times. Um, I can see people taking photos of this. That's, I'm sorry. Um, that's, that's sort of what the experience for enabling hidden experiments looks like. I'll post these in the slides later on. But when you enable hidden experiments, you basically get these like, th these are like highlighted blocks of shame, but they basically mean we're working on these features. Request blocking is the one that you're going to want. Um, this is BuzzFeed. So BuzzFeed is, is always, it's the, it's the height of journalistic integrity. This is BuzzFeed's uh, website. Um, and this is a page where they basically have uh, a whole ton of animated GIFs that are not being lazily loaded in. Um, you, you have a ton of stuff being loaded on this page at once. Let's actually take a look at the network um, waterfall for this. We're just going to load up this page. And there we go. The horses are off. We've got 15 megs in already. That's fantastic. 18 megs. This is, this is just great. Um, okay, so we're going to arrange, let's, let's, use the, let's use the columns, we're going to um, arrange this waterfall by size, and you can see that some of these images are like 3, 3.5 three megs in size, 1.7, 2.5. Now, the cool thing about blocking requests is that if you have, like, if, you, if you're guessing that there's something slow on your page, rather than going back to your development team or the person sitting next to you and saying, like, can we drop that and see what the impact is, you can just block that individual request, it'll get added to a separate new panel at the very bottom. So in this case, I want to see what the impact of trying to lazily load this stuff in is. So I'm just going to block these for my initial page render. I'm going to block some of those um, large images. We've blocked maybe six or seven of them. Let's refresh this page now to take a look at the impact on the network waterfall. Now, this is still not going to be amazing. This page is like seriously slow. But in this case, we've managed to reduce it down to about, what is it? 12 megabytes still, which is probably better for BuzzFeed than what they had before. Um, but I'm going to show you where uh, this feature is really useful in a performance case study. So iMore.com is a site that is sort of, it's sort of a new site for iOS devices and, and stuff like that. Um, and they've got some interesting performance issues uh, that I found interesting to try out with the, the blocking network uh, request feature. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to emulate a Nexus 7 tablet loading up the site. Um, and I've currently got it set to throttle at, at 3G speeds. Um, this is something I might read on a, on a train, for example. So we're just going to go and we're going to load up this page. We're waiting for the network waterfall to complete. You can see that it's taking a while. We've got some background colors, we've got some images. Uh, this should be complete hopefully sometime soon, maybe, eventually, still going, still going, got some ads in now, that's great, right, it's, it's, it's enjoying its time, um, right, so we're, we're sort of 32 seconds in um, and we're still waiting for this page to complete. And is it done? It looks like it's done, yay. All right, so um, let's take a look at what the, uh, the screenshot, the film strip looks like for this particular page. There's a lot going on. 
So at six seconds in, we only have like the header's background colors. Uh, we then have the images. We have some some thumbnail images. Um, it's actually not until nine and a half seconds in that we have any meaningful content on this page. Um, when you start to sort of go through the other frames and you look at what else is happening, um, a few seconds later, you start getting the first web fonts kicking in. Um, and the page starts to change a little bit. You keep skipping through. So 15 seconds in, we've got um, half of the web fonts loaded in. You keep skipping through, and you'll see that over time, you then have the ads and the rest of the content um, loading in as well. But this experience is like super duper slow. So let's try to find out why that might be the case. So um, there's a lot of different content here. Some of it's third-party widgets. Some of it's ads. Um, some of it's other really gnarly stuff. Uh, what we're going to do is, if we right-click on the column headers inside of DevTools, you can control um, how we break down that data. So I've decided to organize this data by um, end time, so when the, the network request actually completed. Um, and what we can see here is we've, we seem to have some plugins that aren't necessarily related to this, to this page. We've got a jQuery Clutip plugin. We've got some weird mobile passport CSS file that's loaded in. We've got some font awesome icon stuff that's in this page as well. Got some Google plus one scripts. Go Google. Great. It's also slow. Um, that's, that's like one of the challenges. Like literally everything is slow uh, at the moment. Um, but you've got other stuff. So let's see. What else have we got in this page? Um, we're scrolling through. So we've got this, this one script TMN head actually doesn't look like it takes a lot of time. But it's sort of a it's an, it's an interesting mystery because um, what I'll show you later is that this is actually responsible for dyna dynamically creating additional network requests that are also slowing down the page, um, and that shows up in the initiator column. So things like the uh, the prebid.js thing has got like TMN head right there. And there are our first set of web fonts. So we've got a ton of different web fonts that are being displayed here. Um, I'm not entirely sure why you might need five or six different types of web fonts on your page. I'm not judging. But there's a, an extension you can get called what font that's kind of useful. Um, basically, what what font lets you do is you can select a piece of text, and it will tell you exactly what font was being used, what web font was being used to to like render it. And you can also see um, sort of you know whether there was enough difference there for you to, to to warrant having that in your page. And I know that this is a little bit small because I'm in emulated mode, but you're just seeing just like the fact that there are definitely a bunch of different web fonts uh, in this page that you possibly don't necessarily need to have. So, where are we? Um, let's arrange stuff. Let's see, what are we doing? Uh, bum, 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 bum. Let's arrange things by latency, maybe? Or not? Okay, still lots of stuff on this page. There's another script that's being um, initiated by TMN head. Um, we're just going to start blocking stuff. So in a normal page, if, you, if you're a site that relies very heavily on ads for your revenue, um, the situation is difficult, right? Because you, you need to still be able to make money to, to run your operation, to run your, your business. Um, but you also need to be able to have an experience that's relatively fast. Uh, this is where projects like um, AMP are actually quite useful, accelerated mobile pages. But um, in this case, we're just going to go and start blocking some of these slower third-party widgets um, to see what impact that might have on our performance. Now, in a real-world project, this is going to be incredibly nuanced. You can't you know, just say, well, hey, I'm going to block all my ads, and it's going to fix my problems. Um, you might be able to gather enough data to go back to your ad services and be like, hey, guys, can you like maybe speed this up a little bit, please? Um, in this case, I'm just going and I'm blocking a lot of those resources that the ads in this page are loading in, like all of the additional style sheets and different libraries and scripts and stuff. There's a ton of beacons. There's like chart beat stuff and other bits and pieces being loaded in here. Um, you probably don't need 339 network requests on a, on a normal, decently performing page. So we've gone and we've blocked a bunch of stuff. They'll show up in red if they've been blocked. And we're just recording the frames on this page at the moment to see what impact um, network blocking, just a few of those widgets, has had on our overall performance. So it's still, you know, the page is not, it's not incredibly fast, but it's, it's loading a little bit faster than it was before. Um, and if we take a look now, you'll see that um, our background colors are in there at 2.78. Our first meaningful paint is now occurring at five and a half seconds. So this is the point where the user has got text on the screen that they can read. They can scroll through and they can actually read and consume your content. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's more than 50% of a difference of what we had before. Almost more than 50% of a difference. Um, 
but you know this is again this is incredibly nuanced i just think that you know using using the the um, network block and request feature is sort of useful for for you know seeing if you've got uh, a guess about what's slow and trying it out um you can go back and try to make a difference to it. So uh, next, let's hit up timeline. Now, uh, Jank is something that uh, a lot of us run into these days when we're trying to build compelling experiences on the web. Uh, it would be wrong for me to not call out Google on places where we're slow, because reasons. Um, so this is Google Play, and uh, when this is what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up um, Timeline, and this is a page where we've actually got um, a lot of lazy loaded behavior. So if I keep scrolling down this list of movies, it's going to keep um, appending items to this list. So I'm recording my timeline. Um, there's a little bit of jank in this page because it's got to go and fetch that content and then inject it, but it's doing it in a way that's not particularly optimal. So here we've got like a whole lot of stuff happening. But what I want you to pay attention to is this area of red at the very, very top of the timeline. Now that area of red, that like almost thick red bar, is in fact little triangles. It's like lots, hundreds of little tiny red triangles. Um, now in timeline, if you select a block um, of action and it's got a little tiny red um, triangle on it, that means that it's an indication of jank in your page that you should probably try fixing. Um, if you click on, if you're not sure what jank is and you haven't really come across these concepts before, don't worry about it. Um, if you click on the jank keyword uh, inside a timeline, we'll actually take you to all of our new docs that cover this topic in detail and show you how to, to walk through trimming down the jank in your pages so you don't experience jitter um, when you're trying to scroll down or anything like that. So keep an eye out for those red triangles. They're very, very important. In this case, um, what was slow was we had a really long-running XHR, um, which then just like took way long. It was injecting stuff into the page in a very um, slow way. Now, I've shown you the film strip in the network panel, which is great for your initial load experience. But what we thought would be interesting is also adding this feature to the timeline so that you can also profile um, what it's like when you've got interactions that are happening post-load, so when the user is perhaps interacting with your page in some way. So here we've got timeline, um, and if you zoom in, you'll see we've added a new checkbox called screenshots. So we're just going to check screenshots. Screenshots is checked. And I've got a timp and a stemo up um, at the moment. This is using SVG clip paths. And when I click on this, you'll see that we have this really beautiful effect um, that just transitions into the next view. Um, I've recorded that. I'm just going to stop the recording now. And what you'll see is we have this new film strip that's also available in the timeline that shows the progression of that animation. I can actually stop and highlight any block within the timeline now. I can see exactly what part of that animation was responsible for, for jank or slowdown. I can see some of those red triangles again. Um, and that, that gives me a really, really clear indication of what needs to be fixed up, where I need to be spending my time improving this animation a little bit further. And you can then you know, dive down and find out all the different um, records that are responsible for, for, for you know, drawing that thing to the screen. And, and you can hopefully then optimize it a little bit further. So that's film strip or screenshots inside the timeline panel. Um, aggregated details is sort of huge. It's, my, it's one of my favorite new features. Now normally when you think that you have a performance problem in your site or your app, you will go and you'll play around with like network, you'll play around with memory, you'll play around with timeline, and you'll hopefully guess that something looks like you know it's, it's wrong or broken. Um, and sometimes that's not quite as simple as you'd like it to be. Um, I swear I'm not picking on sfgate.com, but we're on sfgate.com again, uh, which is a slow site. And um, we're on the business section at the moment. Um, I'm just going to open up their menu and go over to sports. Still recording my timeline. Um, I've actually had to really speed up this screencast because they're that slow. So I'm, I'm jumping 30 seconds at a time just so we don't we don't we're not waiting for this page to load. So, 81 seconds in, it's it's still it's still doing its stuff, um, and that is basically what the the timeline records for this page look like. I have no idea what's going on here. There's just like so much crap. If you have a page that basically has uh, you know um, a, 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 a strip that looks like this, be worried. Be very very worried. Um, now, rather than diving in and, and trying to figure out what's going on there, I'm just going to go straight to the aggregated details panel. What this tells me is it breaks down by costly functions exactly where time is being spent. And it'll attribute it to either a script or a domain. So I know exactly whether it's my third party widgets or my ads, or my video players, or whatever it is that's actually causing this. In the case of this particular page, we can see that um, 
there was a site called Perform Group that was causing us issues. Um, I can also group this by URL. So I can see just by telling, um, just by reading this URL off, that there's actually a video player using AngularJS that's particularly slow in this page. They've got ad managers, they've got Twitter widgets, they've got um, more and more ad managers and stuff. Um, and also group this stuff by domain and find out exactly what domains are responsible. You can click through and take a look at the source that's responsible for your slowdown so you can try to understand exactly why a, a function is particularly costly. Um, but this is just a really big time saver for you. Like if you think you've got a problem with your page, go to aggregated details. Take a look at exactly, you know, is it, is, is it a problem with your site, which might mean that it's going to be under um, unattributed or your actual domain? Or is it a problem with something else that you're including in your page that may or may not be out of your control? So check out the aggregated details pane. Um, another thing I thought would be interesting is, is diagnosing a, a, a small app. So we've got, this is a Hacker News app. Um, the idea here with this app is that um, as you scroll through, it's going to keep loading in news stories. Um, and in fact, I'm just going to run this and, and show you what it's like. So we're just going to record our timeline. Um, as we scroll, um, you'll notice that the colors of the state for each article um, is changing. So it changes from a dark gray to a slightly um, lighter hue, um, and then it'll turn really, really bright as soon as the article is available. So we're just going to hit finish. Um, I recorded that interaction. And uh, what you'll find, so let's wait for the records to just load up, and they'll hopefully be done real soon. Okay, so when we start off at the very beginning, um, you'll notice that everything is fairly good performance-wise, and then we hit these red, you know, this really big red line of, of stuff as soon as we start scrolling. There's a lot of different stuff happening here, and what you'll notice is that a lot of these blocks are very similar, meaning we've got repetitive behavior. Um, that's probably a single problem that we can fix. So here we've got um, a particular frame of expensive time. It's taking up 58 milliseconds. Remember that I told you for a single animation frame, you, you should be keeping it under 16.67. So I've clicked through, um, and I can see that on scroll, I'm actually doing a lot of work here. And I'm calling this one function called colorize and scale stories. Let's jump through to the source for this. What this is actually doing every single time I scroll is it's looping through every single item in this page it's then accessing it, it's setting um, inline styles, it's doing a bunch of calculations, it's doing basically a whole lot of work every single tick that you scroll down through the page. This is technically not really necessary to your core user experience here. If you want the user to be able to like scroll through your stories really, really fast, maybe you don't actually need this um, in there at all. You could probably optimize this a little bit better. But let's say that we just went here and we disabled colorize um, and scale stories just to take a look at what impact that has on the overall experience. So we go back to timeline. Because we've just hit save, um, the VM is going to update the code dynamically. We're just going to um, scroll through here. Um, once again, you know, scroll through, uh, add in new stories as we scroll. What you'll see is that scrolling is actually taking um, a lot less time than it was before. And look at that. Look, you know, we don't have that huge red bar um, anymore in this page. The user is able to scroll through. They've got relatively you know, the same experience. But that one little piece of interaction where you were changing colors was responsible for a lot of the slowdown. Now, in a real world app, there's probably a little bit more work that you want to do to just make sure that that, you know, that, that little effect is, is a little bit more optimal. But try using these tools. They will actually make your life a little bit better when it comes to, to building apps that, that work well across device. Uh, another thing we added was a paint profiler. Um, so I love Timpanist.net. They've just got the most beautiful demos. Um, so we're going to check this new um, little checkbox called paint. We're going to start recording in this page. And I'm just going to, this is basically a really nicely effect, um, a nicely animated gallery. We're just going to click through some of these items. Um, and that's, that's probably enough of this interaction. So we're just going to hit stop. So we're retrieving, retrieving our events, we're waiting for those to populate up. You can see that we have some long frames um, over here. We're just going to select a group of them. And I'm going to select um, just a block of time, so that's, that's taking up a lot. And what you'll see is we now have a new panel here um, that basically allows me to really, really dissect this page down and get um, into the nitty gritty of what the browser sees. What you'll notice is that as I'm selecting different layers here, they're highlighting directly inside um, of my main browser window. Um, I can actually dissect this based on layers that have been hardware accelerated, layers that haven't been, um, and any block that's taking a particularly long piece of time can be used inside of this panel. All of these um, 
these those sort of figures that are, you're seeing at the very end, those are browser calls to draw figures. Um, over on the right, you'll see the reasons why something um, took a long time. So here we can see the size of a particular area. We can see why it was hardware accelerated. We can see the amount of memory that particular um, area, that particular div took up. We can see if um, it was responsible for any slow scrolling. Now, if we wanted to dive into even more detail, we've, we've given you access to a paint profiler. This lets you see the exact browser draw calls for w you know, what got the pixels onto the screen. So you can scrub through and see, okay, well, what was involved in drawing just that exact div by the browser? What matrix calls were involved? What rectangle calls were involved? If you're building something really, really complex, these types of tools are actually quite useful in digging down into your performance issues. Um, we also added support for 3D because why not? Um, if you've ever looked at sort of a 3D view in another browser before, that's fake 3D. This is like, this actually tries to visualize um, the different layering, like the, the st stacking context inside of the browser, so you know exactly at what layer things are being drawn on top of each other. Um, this is useful uh, in particular if you're running into areas where like things are not quite appearing where they should be, um, or one area of the page is slow um, where, where you know, you're expecting it to be pretty fast. But um, this is a really, really good dissection tool for understanding you know, the, the anatomy of your page and, and where things um, could be potentially improved a little bit better. And the show um, slow rectangles area uh, option is actually quite useful if you've got a page where you're experiencing some jank on scroll. Next, let's talk about animation. Now, increasingly, we're trying to build things that um, are able to compete with native. Um, things that are able to look really beautiful and have got you know, some nice subtle animations as the user is interacting with your page. Uh, something that we're working on at the moment is a brand new animation inspector. Uh, this can be enabled, once again, by experiments. It's not quite ready yet, but it's almost there. Um, here I've got uh, a demo um, of a page that animates this beautiful big bald head. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm currently inside of the elements pane. I'm going to check this new little option that I get in the corner here. And I'm just going to reload the page. What this gives you access to is a complete timeline of all the animations as well as the DOM nodes that are responsible for each of these. So I can individually select each of these animations and I can see what's happening with them. It'll also highlight the animation itself, um, so like the fade or the pulse in this case. Um, I get access to uh, the ability to control playback speeds as well. So if I wanted to tweak um, how slow or how fast a particular animation was, I can do that directly using this player at the very top. I get the ability to scrub through too. And if I wanted to control the speed of any individual animation um, as part of my CSS transitions here, I can actually go and edit those. I can scrub through, um, as I was mentioning. And uh, we can just go and we can play back this effect to see in real time what it would look like. You don't have to go back to your editor and make those tweaks. You can just do it directly inside of the DevTools. Um, this is sort of really, really useful if you're building anything that is supposed to move on the screen. Um, and we hope to have it uh, out of experiment sometime soon. Uh, something else that we added uh, a little while back was the Cubic Bezier Editor. So uh, this is Leah Veru's uh, Cubic Bezier tool. And what this basically allows you to do is go in and edit um, Bezier equations. You can control sort of the duration. You can see sort of the progression over time um, for any of your, uh, your Bezier equations. Um, and you can preview what they look like in real time. You get a bunch of different presets for them too. Now, we thought it would be interesting to try baking something like this directly inside of DevTools. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and quickly query for those two boxes, so the purple and, I guess, cyan colored boxes. And you'll see that those are two canvases. And if you click on the Cubic Bezier equation, what you get now is a Cubic Bezier editor directly inside of DevTools. It has presets for um, different types of Bezier curves that you can use for configuring the animation. Um, you can go and you can directly tweak the curve yourself if you want to as well. And if we hit go in this page, because we're applying all of this in real time, you can preview what it looks like inside of your page. Um, at the very bottom, um, you also get access to a bunch of presets, like linear and ease in and inside. Um, so you don't have to go and like Google for those options. Um, again, just a few more tools we're adding to try making motion and animation development on the web a little bit more pleasant. Um, if you're working with views at all and you're trying to animate those views in, sometimes you'll find that it's a little bit tricky to understand what exactly is changing inside of the DOM. So here's um, another Timpanist demo where uh, I've got, I've got my, my DOM tree open at the moment and I'm just going to go and I'm going to animate in the next view. What you'll see is that we're highlighting in purple any of the classes on nodes that are changing. So 
if, for example, you're wondering, okay, well, I've got a bunch of different um, divs in my page. I'm not entirely sure what it is that I'm animating. Um, these highlights are actually quite useful for like quickly visualizing, okay, well, that's the one that's currently animating with the wrong classes. I need to go in and tweak that up a little bit. I believe that's currently in Chrome Stable. You can go check it out. Now, on the DOM and styles part, I thought it'd be interesting to cover this stuff because sometimes, you know, sometimes you go to a developer conference and half the audience will be designers, half of them will be developers, and it's always good to cover this stuff anyway. So, in the elements panel, um, we've been putting a lot of time into color recently. Um, one of the first things we added was the ability to get uh, an eyedropper tool. So you can select any color in your page and go and play around with it. You don't need to use an OS level tool for this stuff. Um, that's been in there for a while. But something new we've added is uh, support for color palettes. So the first thing in color palettes that you get is the ability to break down all the different colors available in this current page. So we'll go and we'll pluck those out. And if you're trying to tweak um, your design, your layout, this is really, really useful for just being able to generate a palette um, that's particularly useful. Uh, next, we've added support for the material design colors. So Google's material design um, style guide, we've got all the colors from there baked in as well, so you can go and tweak around that um, if you're building an app that's perhaps using Polymer or Material Design Lite or something like that. Um, and finally, if you're uh, someone that's, you know, again, a designer, we've also added support for custom color palettes. So you can actually go, and across all the projects you're working on, you can define um, a bunch of different palettes that will be saved inside of the DevTools Elements panel that you can access later on. Um, everyone knows that CSS is awesome, it's the, it's the best thing ever invented, never dies. But finding CSS selectors in the DOM tree can sometimes be a little bit tricky uh, and something that we could probably improve. So something that we put a little bit of time into uh, was trying to improve the search experience for finding things inside the DOM tree. So I'm currently on codepen.io, and I want to find something in the page. Now, instead of looking for it by just a string, I'm going to use a selector instead inside of the search box, which you'll see is it's first of all found me exactly what I was looking for. I'm actually interested in inputs inside of here. So I'm just going to expand that to say class input. And I can actually now just go and traverse up and down the DOM tree using my, um, using my find um, to look for exactly what I'm looking for without needing to know the name of any of those, those nodes, without needing to know, um, you know exactly what class names they perhaps are using. Just a little tiny thing that can, can maybe save you a few milliseconds every day. They add up over time. Um, how many people here have heard of elevator.js? Just like a few people. Okay, a few people. I love elevator.js. This is basically what elevator.js does. So let's say that you've got a, you know, a page with lots and lots of content, and you, know, you have to scroll down to the very bottom of it because reasons. Um, what elevator.js does, it basically gives you this nice, nice little button at the bottom, and you just click it. And, uh, this is the best thing ever. So let's say that we wanted to um, find out exactly what events were bound to this, this back to top um, button over here, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go, we're just going to select that particular button. Um, if you go to event listeners inside of the elements pane, what you'll find is that we actually list all of the different events um, for specifically this node. You can click through and go here. What you'll see is that Everyone should have ASCII inside of their source code. If you're not doing it, you're doing it wrong. But basically, this allows you to jump directly through to um, you know, the, the events that are uh, currently bound to this particular button. Um, it's super, super useful. Check it out. It's been there a while. Check it out. Um, another thing we've recently added, uh, again, in the last couple of weeks, um, is support for framework event listeners. So a lot of people these days will either be using a library or a framework when they're trying to build an app. Maybe you're using React, maybe you're using Angular or Ember or something like that. Um, basically, this feature allows you to um, uh, check out the event listeners that are registered on nodes, even if they're using a JavaScript framework. Um, what that means is that, so here we've got um, to do MVC, a lovely project um, that uh, so basically, this is a jQuery to do MVC app. And uh, normally, so before we added in this feature, if you tried to debug what events were bound um, on a particular item that were perhaps using jQuery, what you'd find um, is that it would just tell you the line of jQuery that was responsible for this, which isn't useful to you in any way, shape, or form. What's better is this. This is what um, this feature basically enables, the ability to see exactly what line of your code um, is responsible uh, for those events. So uh, framework event listeners are really, really useful. If you're using a framework or a library of any sort, check them out. They just make debugging your events so much more pleasant. 
Um, something else that we added in, I'm not entirely sure why, but it's useful, um, is the ability to edit HTML directly inside of the console. So here is the Canadian government's website. Um, it had an image carousel, whereas the UK government decided to make their pages fast. Um, so, yay. So I'm currently inside of the console. I'm using $0 to query um, the first image on this page. Um, and I'm just going to go in, and I can actually now edit the HTML for this directly inside of here. So I'm just going to update that. And now I've got Nicolas Cage, <laughs> which is so much better. It's an improvement. Canada loves it. Um, I'm just going to use $$ to query all the other images in this page, because why not? Um, something else we do now is that you can actually get a live preview of all of your different image resources um, that you've queried inside of the DOM, directly inside of the console panel, um, which is useful because usually you'd have to like right-click and then open it up in a new tab. And this just saves you a little bit more time um, when you're trying to, to debug images in your pages. Finally, we've got JavaScript. So a few years ago, things like this were, were all the rage. Um, if you don't know these, it's, it's okay. You're in, a, you're in a room of friends, colleagues, developers. Um, you've got, so these are console pro tips. So the dollar zero at the top basically refers to the last um, item that you've uh, inspected inside of the DOM tree. Dollar dollar is something that we managed to get standardized cross browser for query selector all. Please don't use this in production and ever. This is basically just for DevTools. So if, you've, if you're writing DevTools scripts or debugging, use dollar dollar. It's basically the same as QSA. Um, you can copy things directly to the clipboard. You can inspect things dynamically. You can use console timestamp to, to log times. Um, this is all old stuff. What we've been working on recently is, is far more interesting. So one of the first things we did, we've got another to do MVC app here. Um, and what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go to the, uh, the settings pane inside of DevTools, first of all. And I'm going to enable um, an option uh, under sources called display variable values in line while debugging. So we've got that checked off. Um, I'm just going to close that up. And we're going to add in a breakpoint. Um, so that any time that I try adding something to this page, we're basically just going to hit that breakpoint. I'm going to try adding in some text. So buy a new laptop because science. Um, and we're going to try adding that to the page. We're going to hit our breakpoint here as expected. What you can now see is that we actually show you exactly what the VM sees. All of the different variables that are involved in this process now give you their values in line. So I can see exactly what my to-do um, object represents. I can see all of the different child values, all of the values for my models, all the values for my arguments and the parameters that I'm passing through, my entire um, stack of stuff going on inside here. Um, this makes debugging way, way, way nicer. You don't have to go console logging every single thing inside of your app. You can just turn this mode on and start traversing your source code to understand what's happening. Um, so that's sort of uh, inline values that are displayed. You can just keep on going, and you'll see that um, where, we, where we've got a value available, where we've got an option that we think we can show you um, a value for in memory, we'll just display it. And uh, I think it's kind of neat. I hope you'll check it out. Uh, another thing we added was proactive compilation. So let's say that you're someone that you know maybe sometimes uses the DevTools sources panel for editing code. Um, if you go and you add in some code there, um, we'll actually run it directly inside of the VM right away. What you'll notice is that we now um, we, we showed you uh, an error saying that there was something up with your code. So there was a syntax error because it had an unexpected token. And the reason for that error was because we were using the wrong type of quote. But that ran directly inside the VM straight away, giving you instant feedback about your code. Um, as soon as you fix it up, again, it's, it's uh, re-pushed to the VM, and you're able to see exactly you know, what the current state of your code is. Um, if you're using it as an editor, this is kind of useful. Uh, another thing we added, sort of a while back, not, not particularly recently, was for, for black boxing. Um, this is useful if you're, again, you're using a, a library or a JavaScript framework of some sort um, in your applications. So uh, this is currently an AngularJS to do MVC app. Um, we're going to go into our sources here. We've got a controller. Um, and similar to the last example, I'm just going to add in a breakpoint so that anytime I try adding in something, it's going to hit this breakpoint. I'm going to go and add an item in. Um, bum, bum, bum learn about black boxing. Um, you can see that it's hit that. And in fact, if we go and wanted to say, start stepping through our code to understand what's happening, what you'll experience is not your source code. You're going to find yourself stuck in Angular, which is not what you want. This is like next to useless. 
If I keep on stepping through this source, all it's going to do is just keep jumping me through all the different um, methods inside of AngularJS that are responsible for this particular piece of code actually running. See, I'm just like, I'm still stepping through. None of this is useful to me in any way, shape, or form. So what we added was the ability for you to right-click on a script, on a library, black box it, meaning that it basically gets almost sandboxed or ignored by the dev tools. And so if we go back um, to our controller and we start to, to muck, muck around in here again, we're just going to rerun this and try adding in um, another item. So recover from this boom. And what you'll now see um, is that we've got stack frames that are hidden. So these are the frames that um, are sort of being ignored by DevTools. They're happening in the background, but we're ignoring them because they're not really um, useful to you. And when we step through our code now, you're actually seeing that we're stepping through our source. We're stepping through the controller rather than AngularJS. Now this applies, you can apply this to any library, any framework. It's not specific to anything in particular. Um, and one thing that's kind of useful is in the settings pane, you can go and you can define any patterns that you want black boxed up front. So if you find yourself using a specific set of libraries at any point, um, go and check this out. Go and set them up so that they're always being black boxed instead of DevTools. Um, this will save you time. Um, and finally, we've got a promises inspector that we've been working on. Uh, this is another one of those things that are currently sort of being polished up. It's an experiment, so you have to enable it yourself inside of settings. But my, my workflow for debugging ES 2015 promises is usually involving lots and lots of console logs, which isn't particularly fun. Um, what we're going to do instead is we're going to check out the, uh, the new promises pane that we've added and see what, what that does a little bit differently. So I'm just going to hit record. I've got a little promises snippet um, up at the top that I'm running. I'm just going to go and run it, execute it. And what you'll see is we start off in a gray um, unresolved state and then hit green, meaning that our promises have been resolved. Um, I can go and I can check out exactly where my promises were defined, and it will jump directly to the line of code that is responsible. I can check out my chained events, so my thens. I can see where my promises have settled. I can see the time that it's taken for those promises to settle as well, if I'm interested in trying to trim those times down. Let's look at something slightly more complex. So we've got uh, a factorial promise-based implementation here. Again, we see a, a bunch of promises that are uh, resolved, but we also see a red one that was rejected. Um, so you're, you're getting to see all the different types um, of, of finish states that these promises can have. Um, and we also added support for filters. So if you wanted to just filter down to promises that were fulfilled or rejected or pending, it's very, very trivial to do so. Or just you know, look for all the specific promises you want to display in your app. You might be wondering what this async checkbox here does. So um, this demo page I have open here is basically a very, very dumb sort of uh, newsreader app. Um, and it'll just load in a new story every time I try uh, reloading it. So we're going to add a breakpoint um, that's going to be hit every time that a story is being appended to this page. And we're going to try running this demo. So let's like fake a network delay to load up a story. So we're going to hopefully hit that breakpoint. There we go. And what you'll see in our call stack is that there's nothing actually interesting here for us to look at at all. It's got like it's, it's managed to check that there's like one thing happening at a breakpoint, but that's that's about it. I wasn't expecting that. I wanted it to actually tell me what's going on with my promises. So if we hit the async checkbox to enable async debugging support, and we go and we rerun this, let's take a look at what what that does. So what you'll see now is that all the asynchronous behavior that was happening in the background is also now tracked by the dev tools. You can see all of the promises that were being resolved. You can see all of the XHRs that were being um, asynchronously sent. You can see any of the other asynchronous behavior here. If I wanted to go and dive directly into a line of code responsible for any of my promises, again, I can do this um, directly from this panel, similar to how we were doing it before. But that's sort of the promises inspector. Um, still requires a little bit of polish, but we're hopefully going to be able to get it out of experiments soon. And we think that this visualizes sort of the promises chain flow way better than just using console logging statements. So the future. Um, we're currently working on a bunch of other features. Some of the stuff I've talked about today will hopefully be out of experiments soon. We're also working on improving one or two other problems. Um, we're working on accessibility inspection at the moment, because accessibility should not be like a second class citizen. It should be something that's directly baked directly into the dev tools. You shouldn't have to use a separate extension for it. Um, and this is a very, very small preview of some of the accessibility work we're doing. So in this case, um, I selected a DOM node. I, I'm able to see exactly what a screen reader would see. So, oh my god, you know, 
get more buzz. Um, I can see uh, any of the accessibility node information. I can see my ARIA roles that are associated with this particular node. I can see the name of it. Um, we're also working on uh, color contrast uh, tooling as well, and some other things that will make accessibility debugging a little bit more pleasant. But there's just there's lots of stuff coming down the pipeline, um, and there's no way I have enough time to talk about all of it today. But if you're interested in learning more, um, please check out the DevTools documentation. Um, it covers a lot of this stuff in, in a lot more depth. Uh, Umar Hanza also has an awesome site called uh, DevTips, which covers sort of bite-sized DevTools tips and includes like animated GIFs for all of this stuff too. And uh, Paul Lewis has got a really fantastic browser rendering optimization course that's free and you can go and check out. Um, if you're interested in uh, my show with Matt Gaunt, we sort of cover uh, dev tools, we cover front-end tooling and automation. There are horses, there are unicorns that people cry, but it's totally tooling.tips. You can go and check that out too. Um, but that's it for me. Thank you very much. Apparently, that's the first time in nine months that I've finished up with time to spare. Yes. Um, does anyone have any questions? The features that I showed today should be available in Chrome Beta. Um, some of them are going to be in Canary. Um, and some of the slightly older stuff, so um, stuff like black boxing, for example, will be in stable. Um, best option is to just use Canary, and you'll get absolutely everything. Um, so, uh, so some of the work that's going on there. So at the moment, um, the process of trying to debug Node apps involves you having to like use your own hosted uh, DevTools front end. You have to use additional tools like Node Inspector. Um, some of the stuff that we've been talking to the Node community about is what it would, you know what it would look like if you were able to directly tap into the information we have available via V8, so that you know you could get access to like our flame charts, and you could get access to um, all of our memory profiling tools and our auditing tools. Um, basically, everything that DevTools comes with, um, without necessarily having to require the use of a fork or third-party tools that probably have a hard time trying to stay up to date with the stuff that we're doing. Um, so again, that stuff is like super, super early at the moment. Um, I'll probably include a link to the discussions where people can go and check out some of the experiments that do do actually run at the moment. But it's it's coming soon, hopefully. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. So for network requests, you're able to see initiators for those. Um, bum bum bum. Can you do that? I think at the moment the closest you can get to is the initiator column. Um, there's probably more work that we can do there to help you dive back in. I think that I think that doing that would probably be the next logical step after black boxing and framework and event listeners. But um, we should probably file a bug for that and see see if we can explore it. Cool. Any other questions? That's that's. S using sort of the same um, machinery that Workspaces uses, but it's not specific to Workspaces. So if I um, go to the Sources panel and I go and um, you know maybe I'm running an app on my local host and I go and I, I start editing it, um, I can save those changes that I've made and it will patch it directly to the VM right away. I don't have to have a Workspace set up for it. Um, if you're working, if you like using DevTools as an editor and you've got Workspaces set up, you'll you'll get all of that stuff for free. Any other questions? So by turning the profiler on, it speeds up your code. That's weird. <laughs> that sounds like a bug that I didn't catch, and I should probably take a look at it. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. I am mostly perplexed, and we'll we'll take a look at it right after this. Um, any other questions? taken a look at that so far. Um, the closest you can get is probably defining up front your um, like all of your custom network um, profiles for individual countries. But I think that would be an interesting e extension um, idea actually. But we haven't we haven't looked at that just yet. Um, my time is apparently up. I'm more than happy to answer other questions and eat up other people's time, but my time is apparently up. Um, feel free to grab me after if you if you have any further questions. Thank you.